Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me now. I'll continue. This slide is a little bit about credibility as to why I believe I'm the authority in this space to talk on how to write your personal statements. Having written about 104 personal statements, I've had the chance to immerse myself in the journeys of very many dentists. And therefore, I bring my collective perspective from having coached, counseled, or rewritten many applications. Um, I am also the founder of Capit Simplified, like I mentioned. And currently, I work at a startup in the Bay Area as their head of growth. Um, this Bay Area startup has about $60 million, and they're trying to reach every American healthcare consumer with an application. Uh, I manage an extremely large team that writes marketing content that reaches doctors, that reaches life, life science companies, and that reaches patients. What that means to say is that I'm extremely well-versed um, in understanding what the patient needs, what a doctor needs, and what a large healthcare organization needs in terms of um, buying into content. I've also had the opportunity with Noura to interact with many admissions committee members, including uh, members who work at ADEA um, on issues of, in of international dentistry. So um, I think this is why I am an authority to speak in this space, and I would love to share my knowledge on SOPs for you. Also a small tidbit, I did work at Invisalign for a bit as a practice management consultant. So I was uh, hands-on in several dental practices, maybe over a hundred in the US, watching what technology people employ and watching what, how US dentists actually provide care to patients. Up next. Here are two books I would recommend if you want to write your own SOPs. These uh, two books are what changed my life as a writer, and I highly recommend you reading them. Please take a screenshot if you want to order them off Amazon. The first book, Smart Brevity, uh, is written by the, comp the founders of Axios HQ, and they, they teach you how less is more, how fewer words being extremely concise and short sentences can make for a very, very catchy presentation. The second one, Strunk uh, White Elements of Style. This is probably a book you must have used when you wrote your college essays back in high school or back in middle school. Uh, but I think it's extremely relevant that makes us a prolific writer, whether it's an essay, an editorial, or an application. Uh, both of these books are, one is a classic old one, one is a brand new one, but both of them make you extremely powerful in writing. And uh, I think the writing journey that comes with an SOP continues even after dental school when you are trying to establish yourself as a key opinion leader in dentistry. So now that you've seen these books and probably taken a screenshot, let me move on. Uh, an often asked question to the Capit Simplified team, and even a question we introspect about often is, can AI replace good writing from a human being? We have ChatGPT, Bard, and a couple of other big AI tools that are out there that have become really popular since 2019, since GPT-3 first came. And we wanna compete with AI in writing better than it. Uh, the fact is AI cannot beat humans in terms of creative writing because of one simple thing. AI does not have <coughs> context. Context is what you get through your experiences having been in a journey, having watched things, having understood what an admissions committee thinks like, that context, AI can never replicate. And because of that, you will always find unnatural writing from natural creative writing. Uh, also, if you do not know, many of your applications first go through an AI filter before it goes to the desk of a human being. This is both true for jobs at DSOs as well as for admissions committees. And these AI tools can easily parse out AI-generated content. The reason being, all content written by AI is regenerative content. It is repurposing old content. And therefore, it's extremely easy to find plagiarism. It's extremely easy to detect if a bot has written it and not a human being. 
So the only AI I would recommend using are grammar tools or editing tools. I would not recommend using AI tools because that's going to put you in a very bad spot and create a black mark in your application. One of the grammar tools that we use even at Capit Simplified is Grammarly. Um, please do not completely accept all suggestions that Grammarly gives you because at the end of the day, it's not a human being. You will only know context. So be very prudent about which, which changes you're accepting and which you are not. Uh, this QR code down here is a beautiful article written by a professor in Singapore on how he was able to distinguish an AI written essay from a human written essay. And he explains how, how that impacted him in his admissions evaluation. So please scan this QR code if you have a second device and maybe read this article. Moving on. Uh, this picture up here, me trying to figure out who I am before writing an SOP was recently posted on Capital Simplified's Instagram channel. And I loved it. It's pretty much what every person goes through when they're writing, beginning to write their SOP, a journey of discovering themselves and a journey of just trying to articulate and uh, figure out who they are. It's kind of difficult because we are often told not to write our own biography, boast about ourselves, bring out our true authentic voice. And yet that's exactly what we need to do within 5,200 characters. So just like this monkey watching a mirror and scratching its head, I've, I've seen several people, including myself, trying to scratch our heads, figuring out who we are. To make things easy, uh, even if you'd missed this Instagram live, please scan this QR code below for a beautiful article we just published this morning on how to write an SOP. In about 5,000 words, our teammate Meenakshi has explained with examples how you can write an SOP from start to finish. Uh, I highly recommend this article. Even if you cannot scan the QR code, uh, please go to capitsimplified.com's blog and look for the SOP article that got posted this morning. Uh, it's pretty easy and it'll, it'll really trigger your creative juices in terms of discovering yourself. That is all the marketing. Now let's go into the meat. The first thing to keep in mind for SOP writing is structure. And figuring out structure before you enter writing is critical because that will, that will only help you organize your creativity. Um, so there are three different types of structure that you can employ in your um, SOP. The first one is chronological. This is the most used structure where you just have a timeline of events from the time you graduated from dental school uh, maybe sometimes people talk about childhood, but childhood, graduation from dental school, moving on to your MPH or MHA program or your MDS program, then moving on to how you came to the US, what you shadowed, where you shadowed, what you volunteered at, any dental assistant services that you must have rendered, then you must have done some preceptorship or fellowship, and then finally how you want to apply to your ADA capital process. So you take a timeline view of events and then you just characterize how you've learned different things at each step. Um, this, is, this is the standard path that most people take and it's extremely safe to work with. If you think you have a little bit more flair with writing and you are able to contextualize your knowledge, then go with the second type, uh, the experiential type. This is like a Jeffrey Archer book, if you've read one, where, or it's like a movie where, um, First, you, you zoom in on the protagonist, and then when the protagonist has a crisis, you go into the protagonist's flashback, you hear that story, and then the protagonist continues. Now the protagonist falls in love, and then you explore that love in a different country with, with a background song, and then you continue further from that. But basically what you're doing is instead of having to go through a single straight timeline from history to present, you are going and exploding into experiences. You are focusing each paragraph of your SOP on a specific experience and you're trying to talk about everything that happened in that. So let's say one experience is how you built your knowledge of dentistry. You're talking about BDS, you're talking about uh, your current program, your preceptorship, you're talking about something else. 
The next paragraph can talk about research. You're talking about how you learned data analysis back in high school. You learned to talk about how you did a recent publication. You talk about how you did an, a local interview at a local conference, but you're covering all the aspects that come into that experience. So experiential is extremely interesting because it helps an admission committee quickly understand, oh, oh my God, within the area of research, within the area of understanding diversity, this person has a surround sound experience from many different touch points in his life um, or her touch points in, his, in her life. So that's a, this is a very, very innovative technique you can, you can use and really impress an admissions committee. The third one is called thematic. Uh, this, this is my favorite. Uh, the initial inspiration for thematic came from a book called Soundbite. Um, if you like reading again, please buy this book Soundbite on Amazon. Um, it, it talks about how an admissions committee evaluator has to go through so many applications at the same time and make a very quick decision while forwarding applications to a senior member. So let's say I get about 300 applications in UIC. Now I need to, from that 300, shortlist 30 to call them for interviews. How am I going to shortlist such a large number of people and characters into a very small pool of people? That's where Soundbite comes into play. A Soundbite is basically a two-line description of your personality. So instead of writing the entire SOP first, and then trying to decode what is the two-line description of you, you take it in reverse. You start with the two-line description first, and then using that two-line description, you explode that into a 5,200 character essay. You basically build your entire essay around a single theme. This becomes very, very interesting, right? Now, let's say your theme is how you are a lifelong dancer, and the fact that you are a Bharatanatyam dancer the, the melody, the rhythm, the discipline, the stamina, all of that kind of translates into everything you do in life. Let's say you are a, you were a childhood dentist where even without a professional degree, you looked out into people's teeth and you wanted to make them aesthetically pleasing when they went into their weddings. And how that, that understanding, that appreciation of aesthetic uh, appearances continues to motivate you in everything you do. Um, so you basically choose a theme and you build around it. Maybe you grew up in an army family and you've learned some things, experiences that nobody else has had. How do you look beyond remorse? How do you understand how uh, army people have to work in a post-retirement setting? How do you understand um, the struggles that somebody would go through if they were in a public employed job or they had a constantly shifting job where they had to go from one city to another. But you basically take a core theme, a fundamental theme, and then you build around that theme in the entire SOP. So here I have kind of spoken about three different ways you can structure your personal statement. You choose what uh, fits for you, right? Uh, at Cap Simplified, when we help code people rewrite, we choose a third type, which is thematic but you can definitely choose experiential or chronological also. Having seen what structure looks like, let's get into the next topic. Awesome. What should be covered in an SOP? An SOP should fundamentally answer one thing, best fit. Now, you, when you think of a fit, you think of a bottle and a jar, right? It's not just about the size of the bottle, it's also the size of the, sorry, the bottle and its cap. It's not just the size of the bottle, but also the size of its cap. Both need to intricately weave into each other for it to fit. So if either you do not showcase the right personalities and traits that the school is expecting, or the school doesn't have the right characteristics that you are looking for, and there is no match, there will not be a fit. Obviously, a school does not need to pitch itself to students because they get so many applicants already, but it's very important that you demonstrate fit. If this is not about you being awesome or you being like very, very mediocre. It's about demonstrating fit. I can showcase many, many applicants who have not had experience, 
who have not had us uh, like exposure who have not had fantastic gmat or uh, gre or um, invd scores or like attempts in in how how fast they passed and yet they got into schools the reason that happened is because they demonstrated fit how are you going to demonstrate fit in your personal statement these are like seven points you can you can look into first introduce a hook a hook is a catch phrase maybe a proverb maybe an instance in your life maybe an opening scene to your entire essay or you're talking about your theme do you want to know how bharatanatyam has influenced everything in dentistry today basically you, you have a very very um attractive hook that will keep the audience engaged in everything that you read you must have listened to several videos on youtube that say the first 45 seconds are when a person's attention peaks when they engage with new material so when a person engages with your essay after 45 seconds their context starts switching automatically because of all these distractions so within the first 45 seconds are you going to create an effective hook that will keep them reading through the entire uh, article so think about the hook first put that in the first paragraph the next one is talking about who you are now when you say who you are it this is not what you are what you are are your achievements are your professional qualifications who you are is um <laughs> very difficult to explain who you are is who you are as a personality what's your personality what are your, what are your aspirations uh, what hurts you what uh, makes you happy uh, what are the what are your principles what are your gui- guidelines what what's your vision that is who you are like maybe because of your childhood maybe because of some influences you've become the person you are try to talk about that those aspects when when people try to say personal versus professional this is why you talk about your personality and and personal life to describe who you are if the if human beings come together because of the work they do but human beings stay together because of who they who they are they team stay together because of your love for the other person like by love i not mean romantic love but i'm saying the genuine appreciation of who the other person is and their existence try to establish your existence and earn the empathy of your reader so describe who you are with a personal story i would mostly talk about childhood stories and the setting that you grew up in to talk about who you are the next one is pivots and empathy sorry pivots and ep- epiphany in everybody's life there may be some moments that just stand out maybe it was the time you got abused maybe it was the time you helped a person and felt unreal maybe it was the time you lost someone maybe it is the time you made the first investment in your life and you lost all your money whatever it is whether it's extremely happy or extremely sad these are the moments that define us these experiential pivots they suddenly bring us focus in life they change the way we're going to make decisions they influence and they block us from exposure to any new things identify your pivots or epiphany and put them on that's op this paragraph is probably the most important if you can art- articulate your story as a series of pivots or a series of epiphanic moments that will change your life epiphany is not looking at a writer or scanner for the first time in your life and saying wow oh my god this digital scanner is changing everything it is about appreciating oh if i can digitally scan someone without an hallucinate impression that is going to probably change access to care entirely that moment of understanding that i can now deliver services faster and sooner across countries within a short span of time maybe that is that was your epiphany talk about that the next one is why us dentistry <laughs> uh two things here first be honest if you think your reason to come to the us and do dentistry is only for financial gains and to get a better standard of life definitely mention that second while you're being honest go a step further and try to differentiate yourself everybody is probably saying the same thing us dentistry is technologically advanced us dentistry is research focused everybody who i saw on my textbook as a prof- uh, as a author is now a real human being in the us us dentistry is probably uh, far covered 
and stuff like that. How do you have those same opinions as the many people coming to the US and yet have a different opinion? Think about that. I'm not going to give you the answer right now, but but I want you to think for yourself. How can I establish my awe or my reason to come to US dentistry as both compelling and as different? The more different you are, the more be- the much better you'll stand out. Uh, maybe one example, when I spoke about uh, care, I used to speak about how care is very unbiased for transvestites. When Noura spoke about care, she spoke about how US dentistry was far ahead of the curve in terms of providing dentistry to children with special needs. So that was her epiphany. That's how, that's what compelled her to come to the US and she wants to propagate that to the world. So each person has a different motivation, a different inspiration as to what US dentistry uh, helped them. Oh, we have somebody who wants to be in the video. Uh, maybe, maybe towards the end, we'll have a Q and A and you can happily pop up in the video. Uh, then next one is how do your experiences show that you will be a good US dentist? This is very important. That this means you need to first observe a US dentist and write down what makes them successful. Is it their ability to work with a care team on a peer level basis? It is, is it their ability to provide four-handed dentistry? Is it their ability to use rubber dams and every other protocol under the sun applied by FDA? Is it their ability to be an active alumni, active community service member, and an active dentist in the clinic? Is it their ability to effectively communicate in English and Spanish because they want to uh, provide services to the the local community? Is it their ability to also engage in additional activities outside of dentistry while only going to a clinic for three days and probably one more day for academic research? Is it their ability to to employ evidence-based dentistry within their clinic? Is it their ability to effectively coach themselves in new technologies by attending conferences and CE courses even 40 years into the profession and bring that quickly into the clinic? Whatever it may be, right? I've given you a lot of examples. What makes a US dentist awesome? What makes them successful in their profession? Watch those characteristics and then relate them to you. Showcase how your experiences relate or point to you being successful by saying, okay, this is what makes US dentist good. And this is how my experiences connect to those, those characteristics. If I would, if I were a kid and, um, I, I, I mean, I, when I was a kid, I would, let's say I, I was the young, younger child of, a, of an elder sister. And I saw my elder sister go through a lot of, uh, torture because she was a teen in a conservative family. My, my ability to empathize and understand that will probably make me a good care provider because I will be unbiased to different genders. And I appreciate when people are, do not have equal access to care, stuff like that. See, so the appreciation of uh, uh, ability to provide care to diverse groups is what makes a US dentist successful. And I've given a childhood experience that correlates with that. The next one is congruent short-term goal. And the, the very important word here is congruence. Your short-term goal should be related, relevant, and achievable given everything you've done in life. You cannot have spoken about financial constraints, debt, borrowing money, struggling, having bankruptcy, and then say that, oh, I want to go into a community service practice. That is not practically possible, right? Even if that's exactly what you want to do and you'll find the ways to do it, it just is not congruent. So try to establish a congruent, realistic goal um, before you go into anything. Like after having gone into a clinical dental school, you cannot suddenly jump into research out of the blue if you do not have any experience publishing papers in the past. There's stuff like that. Also, if you have an MPH or MHA degree, and you want to bring both worlds together, do not make an audacious claim like you are going to change access to care overnight. Talk about what is really practical and realistic given all your previous experiences. The next one is talking about an achievable long-term goal. And again, the key word here is achievable. For short-term goal, it should be related to your previous experiences. For long-term goal, it should be achievable given your previous experiences. People want to say like, I want to be the Gandhi of uh, dentistry. 
fine maybe you want to maybe you will i'm not against you being that but that is very difficult for a dental school to help you with achieving if you want to be the the i don't know de shaw of dentistry or if you want to be like the chairman of the ada eventually those are goals that you are going to achieve on your own beyond what dental school can ever equip you with however if you say that i want to be a successful private practitioner or learn these all round skills that make me an entrepreneur understand clinical dentistry being being able to serve evidence based dentistry in my practice incorporate um the the top technology now that those are skills that you that a dental school can equip you with let's say you eventually want to start a mini dso with four practices in your local community in a rural suburban place which has a uh, healthcare professional shortage areas or you want to start a clinic in a rural place because the only there's only one fqhc in that area that is probably realistic and that's probably something the dental school has the amenities and connections and network to help you with right so try to tell them a long term goal that the dental school can help you with it then presents fit because now it says okay this person wants to go and become this they want to eventually become a periodontist they want to eventually become a rural practitioner it makes sense because in my alumni base i have 30 rural practitioners who i can connect this person with and make them successful tell them a goal that they can help you with that's the bottom line let me just kind of summarize everything on the slide really quickly before moving on first have a catchy hook talk about who you are the person not what you are emphasize pivots or epiphanic moments that defined your life articulate why us dentistry by first identifying who a good us dentist is explain how your experiences will make you a successful us dentist describe your short term goal but make it congruent to everything you've done in the past explain a long term goal and make it achievable by by having something that the dental school can help you with having said all of this let's move on to the next slide and i'll probably wrap it up in some time so that we can open for q and a okay there we go us dentistry when you talk about us dentistry there are some nuances that you would want to highlight um each of these can i think we can speak about that for in a separate video by itself but i want you to think about each of these and and if you are going for shadowing experience learn what these mean if you are going for volunteering experience observe what these are if you are going to an academic dental practice asking a professor to show you what these are if you are going to an actual practice to work as a dental assistant making sure you get exposure towards these things if you are back in your home country maybe in egypt maybe in iraq at least building your knowledge of what these are in, in us by reading papers by watching videos and so on it is very important for you to assimilate and understand these fundamental differences about us dentistry so that you can eventually talk about them in your sop or your understanding of that your appreciation of that your exposure to that your uh like how close you are to that first one is application of digital dentistry the key word here is application not digital i've seen so many sops where candidates say oh i saw this cat cam i saw this this thing this machine i saw this beautiful scanner i saw this 3d milling machine don't talk about what the digital concept is i i saw this patient charting system called axiom don't talk about the software or the technology talk about what its application means that's very important understand if i have something that can create faster crowns and the temporary crowns within uh the dental practice at by the chart side and delivered with a cat team practitioner how is that going to transform my practice eventually that's the application talk about the application the next thing is team work in the us more than anywhere else you'll see dentists working in an extremely collaborative manner right when you see collaboration uh they would collaborate with sometimes the caregiver if the child is there they would collaborate with the child's parent literally collaborate and the parent would be extremely vocal in asking for the right services they would also ask uh, collaborate with the care team members if there is 
a consulting dentist coming in or a consulting surgeon or an orthodontist they're referring out to. They would collaborate with them on the patient's care. They would also collaborate with their own team, their dental assistants with four-handed dentistry, their friend desk in making sure the patient experience is seamless. They would collaborate with multiple people to make, make sure the best of care comes in. They would collaborate with the, the billing or coding person to ensure that all the Medicare bills are submitted and at the right time they get reimbursement. So this aspect of collaboration is to an entirely different degree. And for me, I've seen practices in India and practices in the US. I've noticed that it's not hierarchical. It's extremely flat. When we go in as an international dentist on day one on scrubs, they treat us the same way they would treat uh, their you know, dental assistant or something. So try to understand what that collaboration means and explain that, uh, explain how you've been an effective team player in your SOP. The next one is comprehensive care. Um, if you were in a dental school in, in the US, you are solely responsible for the complete care of a patient. Versus in India, if you maybe you were in, in your final year and you were in separate rotations, whichever rotation you are part of, you would only provide care in that specialization. That's a fundamental difference between the way schools operate here and schools operate there. Even if you uh, were to give out a referral to a specialist in the US as a student, you would handhold that process completely giving your, your uh, diagnosis, what's your prognosis so far, and giving your chart notes, making sure you see the x-ray in progress, and even recommending them to go get a second opinion if somebody has given a contradictory uh, thought to what you prefer. So the idea of comprehensive care is something that you'll have to understand. Um, and you can definitely speak about. You'll notice that some doctors, even though they're only in the niche of general dentistry, also talk about how it aff dentistry affects sleep or how dentistry also affects their oral cavity, how, also how dentistry affects their social aspects um, of life, how dentistry affects their, their uh, uh, I don't know, confidence level. So think about all aspects of comprehensive care and, think, and watch how US dentists do it a little differently, especially US students. The next one is standard of care. I think I don't need to elaborate on this. Uh, in terms of protocols, in terms of uh, the, the minimum liable standards that people need to uphold, standards of care of, are pretty high in the US compared to many, many developing nations. Uh, the reason this exists is because most of the standards of care are enforced either by law or enforced by insurance coverage. So the ability to provide a certain care is either limited or influenced to a, to a large part by who the insurance provider is. They dictate terms. And because of that, the standard of care is pretty high. For example, you, you have to take mandatory um, check diagnostic x-rays for certain patients going to certain procedures because you, you wanna cover your ass. You wanna eventually not stay liable to uh, the law if they claim a lawsuit on you. Those kind of restrictions do not exist in other countries because many patients do not exercise their power to, to raise a lawsuit on a dentist and make a lot of money. Um, the next one is community service. Community service has two aspects. One is um, people confuse community service often with charity. Charity is not community service. Yeah, charity is a part of community service, but community service can also be accessing vulnerable populations providing care where care is currently not under access. So understand how community service differs in the US versus other places. In the US, you might, you might be fairly reasonably uh, earning well, you might probably make $65,000, which is the medium US household income. And yet, because of the place where you are, because of other social determinants of health and other constraints, you may not be able to access care. Community service is also about being able to subsidize the cost of care, being able to provide higher scale and volume of care, and being able to provide care in areas where it's currently inaccessible. Um, so community service can be a lot of these aspects. I'll give you one small example. Many autistic patients are denied care um, at dental practices because they take more time, it's a little more cumbersome to treat these patients, and therefore, when Patient, several doctors, specialists don't even accept their patient referrals, don't even give them appointments. So these autistic patients are forced to go to academic dental centers where they would take any patient who comes in. 
similarly complex procedures because a, a dentist wants to make money with fast moving high earning procedures they do not take complex procedures that take a lot of time how do you break that barrier and, and serve the community think about all of these aspects right it's not just i'm what i'm trying to say is community service is not just about cost it's not just about giving something for free at a discount and doing charity watch closely what community service means in the us and and address that an fqhc a federally qualified health center can employ a dentist pay them $120,000 in a remote corner and actually provide high quality service to the local uh people that's also a part of community service is that does that mean the doctor is going under and working for no cash in fact if you work at fqhc after your dds you can have your medical loans or dental school loans uh, reimbursed by the government after a certain time period so you can actually make more money in in a sense and yet you go work in these places so find out what community service means and talk about it the next one is the research opportunities uh does not need speaking most of the papers published are in the us us research gets quoted and cited the most in several books across the world i am not saying that researchers in other parts of the world like brazil or india are not moving the boundaries in terms of what is possible in dentistry but if something happens in the us there is a ripple effect and that ripple effect literally affects more dentists in their everyday practice compared to what happens in a different country a very very naive example is levis jeans levis jeans if you know that the, the brand was devised as a brand a, like a durable clothing uh, wear for people working in coal mines today jeans is part of our culture and it's more prevalent in more countries than you would imagine just like levis jeans dentistry in the us is it has such a big ripple effect so when you think about research think about research not just research today published as a paper but its impact and its ripple for countries in several places uh last one is access to care i have a separate video on cap simplified only about this but it's very interesting in the us they say access to care that means for a patient who is well meaning well intentioned deserving and has the right uh financial bandwidth even for such a person it's so difficult to access care that they deserve can you imagine if you if you were rich in a different country would you have any barriers to access care let's say canada which provides uh some of the best healthcare services of course canada has its own issues that probably drop canada but some other country uh, like like finland or like pakistan if you can own it if you can afford it and you have the right insurance coverage you're probably going to be able to go to the doctor and see and get the care you need whenever you need it in the us it's not like that your insurance has to come in the play your your telehealth monitoring has to be installed you have to get an appointment at the right time so many factors come into place before you can even access care therefore access to care has more barriers there are more barriers between the doctor and the patient than perceivably what they can overcome and access try to understand what access to care means in your um uh, in 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 your like in us and talk to that uh we have another request to come in the video yes i will bring you guys in video in just a few minutes um i'm going to go through just two more slides before we we go to q and a awesome some things to keep in mind some do's please highlight recent experiences many dentists fall into the trap of writing a huge paragraph on why they came into dentistry after 12th standard please don't do that like you've already spent 6 years doing dentistry writing your nbd exam at this point if somebody's not convinced you're going to be in dentistry they might as well like not admit you in the school please focus on recent experiences and talk about them recency uh is something also called recency bias use it to your leverage be proud of your origin do not hide things about where you came from like uh it's it's okay to share stuff if if you did not have employment for some time if you were pregnant and that's why you shifted if you if you came here because of marriage be pr- proud of your story that's that's your story own it and say it with pride right say it claim it make a statement be like one of the, one of those audacious influencers who come um and do not care about fat shaming and use that as the as their value proposition 
to get several model contracts. Be that person, own your story. Introspect and journal. Very important thing to do is showcasing uh, who you are deep within. And the best way to bring this out is either using sticky notes on a big wall like Noura and I did, or take a journal and write about yourself. Write those deep thoughts about who you are that you would not generally share on a CV. Next, um, show who, not what you are. This is like super important. Who you are is, um, is your personality. What you are is your credentials. What you are is your CV. Who you are is your SOP. I don't think I have to explain that further. The grammar speaks for itself. The last one is um, go offline and use sticky notes. Super critical. Uh, when it comes to writing, distraction-free writing or context-switching free writing is very difficult to achieve. You need to create the environment within which you write. You need to create the environment within which you edit. Editing is easier on a PC, but writing is easier offline especially brainstorming, bringing those ideas together, it's very, very easy offline. I've seen many people, instead of using physical sticky notes, they use digital sticky notes and they think it works. They struggle. Several more people, they take in individual ideas and take screenshots of that quickly on their phone and keep them saved. Your, those photos are lost within thousands of photos in your gallery and you'll not be able to eventually coerce a story. But when you go offline, you can create an environment, seclude yourself, you can talk, think about each independent thought, put sticky notes on a wall. Noura had sticky notes stuck behind her bed on a big wall and every day when she wakes up, she look at those sticky notes and stare for some time. No wonder she was able to come up with 25 SOPs right after and she submitted the right one. So, that, so go offline and use sticky notes, highly recommend it. We've spoken about what to do, let's speak about what not to do. Don'ts. <laughs> Very important. People fall into this trap over and over again. In fact, there's also a professional writer for Capit Services who does this. He has like a template and he repurposes the template over and over again. Please do not repurpose a friend's SOP. Don't take an old wall and put new paint. People would, would read through it. Your friend's SOP is not your template. It could be inspiration. Your senior's SOP could be inspiration. It's not a template. Please do not go juxtapose your story inside. Your story is, can be narrated differently. Just like I, I'm a big movie aficionado, and there are some movies in which I don't mind watching the action sequence for half an hour, like Kill Bill. In some other movies, I want to watch the lighter aspects that make me cry or make me uh, happy. Your story is different. It has to be narrated differently in different proportions and in, in a different order. Do not take a template from somebody else. Next. Don't narrate your CV. Like I said, this is about who you are, not what you are. Don't take your CV and then just explode it. I, I've seen many people say, oh, I did shadowing at so-and-so doctor's practice and I've learned skill building, this thing, leadership, qualities, so-and-so. Like that's a list of qualities. No, like strict no. Talk about one or two qualities, but talk about how you learned that quality. What is the evidence that you experienced? Uh, what is the story in, in that sequence? Like, who did you meet? What did you see? How did you learn that? Talk about that. Uh, sh show off your thesaurus. This is like the famous joke that comes in Friends, where a person writes me, to write an essay, Joey, and then he just opens the thesaurus and puts all these complicated words that do not work. This is not a showcase of your voc vocabulary. People are not choosing you into, sc into school because of your English skills. People are choosing you to your school because of your story. An appealing story does not need to be finessed with Shakespearean vocabulary. Next, do not stress too much on titles. Uh, for example, if I were to say my inspiration was uh, Dr. Uh, like Trump, right? I could just say, you know, while working at Trump's practice, I watched how he was very effective and used those techniques to influence my, uh, my treatment or I, I watched how his patient, patient interaction manner was and I tried to develop good rapport building skills with patients who came to his practice. That's sufficient. What is no excessive is saying, Dr. Donald Trump, the president of so-and-so Trump practice in Minnesota, Michigan, recommended this. You don't, you don't need to exaggerate or overemphasize who that person is, it doesn't matter. What matters is what you learned from that person. 
So even when you write like in your SOP and you write your college's name, don't say like national this thing of Sri Lanka by Kama Ahmad blah, 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 blah. Just stick to the point at college in this particular place. I learned this. What you learned is more important than where you learned it or who you, whom you learned it from. Um, don't uh, create lists. I think we spoke about this. Don't just talk about all those skills that you learned. Talk about how you learned them. The last one is don't beg for a seat. We spoke about this two slides before. We spoke about um, fit, right? In a sense, a US school is also as desperate as you are to get you into their school, right? If, if I am a school and I charge $300,000 for a seat for two years and I only have six uh, admits, I want to make sure that the people who are graduating from my school are eventually going to come back and endorse me, give me money through endowments, and also spread a good name to get more applicants into the pool. A school's alumni is probably the biggest factor in determining that school's success, and finan especially financially. So they are begging for you as much as you are begging for them. So don't like say, oh, you're this prestigious institution. I will be a ceremonious person. I'll give everything I can to get into school. Just be to the point. Please evaluate my candidacy and, and see fit. I believe you are a, are a, a good platform to help me achieve my goals. I, I understand that your credentials as an Ivy League school will, will give me that kind of network and skills to help me succeed as a dentist. So just make it quick, sharp and neat in telling why you want to be in that place. But don't just like throw garlands at that person and beg for a seat. That, that, that desperation is not going to get you a seat. You need to be confident about who you are. Next, uh, probably the last slide is here. Um, one thing to keep in mind is American English versus Queen's English. Many of us are from countries that were earlier colonies of Britain, and therefore we learned English that they taught us, like using the passive voice instead of an active voice, being very elaborative instead of concise, um, not using present, present perfect as much. Uh, so instead of going into the nuances of what these are, I'll just give you a quick tip. I just do a gut check, especially when I started writing initially uh, five years ago. I used to use a gut check using Grammarly. In Grammarly, you have the option of choosing language preferences and there's American English, English US versus English UK. If you just choose English US, it would give you recommendations on what, what words or sentences you can swap. At the end of the day, it's your story, own it, don't accept everything Grammarly tells you, but uh, it's something that you need to keep in mind. Small thing to keep in note, keep note of is you, you'll have to assess who is your evaluator. Like if you go to Buffalo uh, School of Medicine, probably many people in the, in the admissions committee themselves have a lot of international exposure. So they're, op they're, they're very fluent with seeing different types of English. So keep that in mind while, especially while writing your supplemental answers. If I were to write to LLU, I would write a little differently from how I would write to Buffalo School of Medicine for our dentistry. The last one is, um, how do you contact us? So I've given you a lot of tips. Um, this might be a little overwhelming on purpose. Use this to craft a beautiful personal statement. If you still need help, if you wanna have a thought partner, or if you want to like bounce off of somebody your ideas, or if you want some help rewriting, contact uh, Flynn. She, she runs Capit Simplified full time. And uh, I've shared the email ID below. I've shared a website link below, which is the SOP, SOP Builder tool uh, on our website. You can use that or just give us a call or even DM us on Instagram. Anything works. We would love to get in touch and help you craft a personal statement. Um, many people have requested to see Noura's personal statement, um, which got her 10 interview invites. I, I, I don't know if we can share that, but I think there's the, most of the, the lessons we have taught you on this call is definitely from what we learned crafting the SOP so many times. All right. Um, Okay, I'm gonna stop um, sharing my screen. And now you guys can post questions or if you wanna come on video, I'm happy to like add you on the video and answer your questions live. Either works, um, choose whichever you prefer.
Hey Jyoti, thanks for following us. Okay, yeah, we have people coming on video. Um, uh, okay, I can't see your. Is there anybody else who wants to come on video and ask a live question? No. Yeah, I can see. It. Hello. Hi, do you have a question? Okay, I hope, I hope you didn't click by accident that you wanna come on video. I wanna close this and let someone else in. Uh, which I do not know how to do, how to close. Maybe here. Okay. Yeah, I'm removing, removing Neeraja. I, I think she clicked by accident. But if there's somebody else, thank you for the session. Are preceptorships necessary for admissions? No, they're not. Preceptorships are necessary. Some kind of exposure uh, to US dental practice would really help you um, to get a US admission. How do we customize the English style for each school when we submit a common personal statement? Is there a safer spot to stick to? <laughs> Good question. You can't customize the English style. The only English style I would recommend customizing is using American US in either Word or Google Sheets or Grammarly. Uh, that will help. That will give you the necessary customization to address an open pool. Bad, you can really customize your language and the way you address people is in your supplemental answers. Um, okay. Can we? Okay. Can we? We write SOP different for every school according to the requirements. Uh, unfortunately not, unless they're in CAPIT. The only school that has separate SOP is CU, of course. So for CU, you should definitely uh, customize your SOP to the extent possible by adding more elements about why Colorado in particular instead of being generic. Can you please possibly provide suggestions for SOP instead of any other team member? <laughs> Utsavika Padia. Uh, I think everybody within Capital Simplified, it's it's us who would discuss pretty much every SOP. So you're 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 already getting my my inputs through somebody else. I I do not think I'll have the bandwidth to come on a phone call and give you, give that to you directly. But um, I get to see everybody's SOP. It's nobody works in isolation within Capital Simplified. Jyoti um, Ratsogi Rastogi, sorry, I missed today's Insta Live, so missed all the info. Okay. Um, is TOEFL home edition accepting for this cycle? Whoa, doctor, uh, that question is not related to SOP, so I'm going to skip that for now, but I'm happy to answer that on our site. Is SOP the more, more important factor for getting invite or LOR? Fantastic question. Um, the, nobody has ever said, no admissions committee member has ever said, in fact, we're talking to an admissions committee member in Michigan next month. Even he mentioned that... Uh, there is no comparison. Like it's not that LOR is more than SOP. From personal experience, I would place LORs a little higher than SOPs. The reason is because you talking about your own your credentials is different from somebody else attesting your credentials. So now it's uh, if you've heard of, heard of the word surrogate marketing, that means you are using the credibility of some some other brand. So when somebody else recommends you, you are using their credibility. Let's say you are getting a, a, a LOR from a dentist you shadowed, uh, shadowed in the US. That person would, would have some credibility having been in practice for a couple of years, having gone to a dental school themselves, having graduated from MDS or some other uh, residency. That branding supports you, right? It's like, it's like um, a reference, a recommendation on LinkedIn, the same thing. It's a recommendation letter. So leverage the power of surrogate marketing and please prioritize LORs more than SOPs. If your school is a school that says, oh, you know what, I'm pay me like so much dollars, I'm gonna give you a standard SOP, LOR, say no. You don't want those LORs, they are not gonna help you at all, uh, and it, it will not improve your credibility in, in an application. I'm sorry, I didn't have a good experience with another team member, so okay. Yeah, so we can probably DM us, um, and I, I'll definitely help you out. I'm sorry that happened. Hey, Karthik, is Dr. Noura practicing her ortho skills on you? 
great question yes the braces i'm proudly wearing the ceramic braces were installed by nora at her practice uh, in uic and um, if you do not know we are also building a um, separate instagram page called asana ortho you can search for dr nora asana on instagram and follow that page so eventually we will open this practice right now our idea is to do it in bay area but uh, in 2025 Noora and I will go full time into dentistry. I'll be her practice manager, and she'll be the head dentist, uh, providing orthodontics services. That's just uh, me talking about myself, my SOP. <laughs> uh, Sanya, the capid is so overwhelming. How can we shortlist dental schools which are in capid as well as outside capid? How do we shortlist the dental school? Uh, that is a video that Noora published on this in our YouTube channel. If you still have questions after that. Uh, please please do dm us we can kind of give you some guiding principles on how to how to shortlist um but i think that 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 deserves a separate instagram live and cannot be done right here jyoti my current dean of the college doesn't know me as he was not there during my graduation time so what should i write in lor um you can still get an lor from a past dean that is that is fine as long as it is that content gets printed in a uh school what do you call that the official form right so you even if this is this this is this is actually more common than you would imagine you would have been under a professor who knows you very well but the professor has either changed institutions or has probably retired um so in that case what do you do you can you can get them get an official letter from them and actually tell how they know you and that's completely fine that's completely fair if you if you can put that put that on an official school letter it will make it more credible when you submit the lower how to begin writing an sop it's sort of starting great question i don't know what your name is maybe it's bh something um how do you start writing buy 3m sticky notes go to your white wall stick the sticky notes in each sticky note write one life experience this is we we'd like to it's like a scatter plot right take different things about your life from childhood what are the different things that are uh, make your story so amazing if you were to shoot a movie about yourself if you were to write a biography about yourself what what are the key things you would highlight right don't don't think from the point of view of a um, cv writer think from the point of view of a script writer what are the key things you would highlight and then slowly you can convert them into the sop so start start with sticky notes guys this this formula has worked so many times so many people i can't like prescribe it more please start with sticky notes write about your random experiences and then we can converge if you want if you like to do it digitally uh, there's an application called mural m u r a l um that you can put these sticky notes and you can like make these different charts so all the yellow is personal experiences all the pink is professional experiences all the blue color sticky notes talks about your your other extra curricular experiences whether in college whether in this thing and then you talk about your education experiences So take these sticky notes and write different things. If you want a quick pointer tool, there are six aspects that make an application really successful. Think about the six aspects: uh, your application itself, your essays, SOP, LOR. Second one is volunteering experiences. Um, third one is community service experiences. The fourth one is work experience. Fifth one is academic credentials, and the sixth one, oh, just ah, uh, oh, my my exams. Like the all the exams that you passed to get your A dot G N B D and so on. This was a great session. Thank you. Are there going to be more Insta Live coming up ready to cap it upcoming cycle? Yes. In fact, the next one will be a uh, a real student gone into school along with Flynn. They're going to be talking on a different topic very soon. Will you be saying this live? Um, I haven't done that before, but I'll find out how to do it and put it in. Oh yeah. Thank you, Addy. Uh, letterhead. I meant the school letterhead. Thanks. When will the result of Capital Simplified Scholarship be declared? Um, we we are actually reading through the applications this week, and we'll we'll I think by next week we should have the, have the answer out. Uh, we got we got a more number of applications than we had imagined. Maybe because the scholarship amount was in the thousand, the around thousand dollars, but. Uh, thank you for applying if you are one of the applicants and uh, we will very soon announce and uh, and reimburse sorry like release the scholarship amount thanks
the session. Thanks, Devansh. Can we please have a recording for the session on your page? Yeah, I, I do not know how to do it, but I'll do it for sure. The word count says 5,200 characters. Seems like it's the maximum limit. How much is the recommended minimum, minimum words? Uh, the 5,200 is characters, not words. Um, my, my personal recommendation is for you to exhaust the 5,200 characters. Uh, there is no minimum. Nobody has uh, been like, rejected or like, given feedback that their SOP was short. Uh, however, I would recommend at least writing 5,000 words. You have the space, fill the space to talk about your story. After a long time, good to see you. <laughs> yes, good to see you too. Uh, can you name some schools which, which mores on clinical practice? Um, okay, this, this also relates to school, uh, how to shortlist schools. There are few schools that are more research oriented. There are few, few schools that are only clinically uh, oriented. But I think I am not the authority in, in, on that topic. So I'll, I'll defer to asking you to watch Nula's video. And in case, again, you, you don't have answers, please um, message us. Can I provide LOR from a HOD instead of the dean of my undergraduate school? Yeah, that's fine. One, one person should be like the head of the institution. And you can justify why the HOD is. Uh, also, you're allowed to give three LORs. So choose one from each. My professor from whom I took LOR uh, from previous cycle has left the college. Is it okay to take LOR from her, but as a private dentist? Nishant, yes. The answer is yes. Um, Prati Mara joined. Cyril, Vishashwi, Neenag. Can you say this video on feed? Guys, yeah, I, I'll try. Priyanka, should the volunteering experiences be dentistry focused or can they be anything in general? Oh, great, great. Uh, so, mm, volunteering can be anything in general. Remember the slide we discussed on SOPs about how um, you demonstrate fit to a US admissions committee or how you say that you will eventually become a successful US dentist? Many of the dentists, the reasons why dentists are successful in the US are actually because of skills that they can learn even outside of dental practice. For example, my ability to socialize, network, build rapport, speak with confidence. These, these things can be learned even by volunteering at a different place. My, my understanding of dental economics, my understanding of how business functions, my understanding of how to manage a team, my leadership skills, my collaboration skills, all of these finer aspects that make you a successful dentist in the US can very well be learned other places. So the, so the important thing is not where you volunteer, but what you learn there and showcase that. Um, there will be a natural bias towards volunteering and dental practice versus somewhere else. But I think what really matters is the story and how you articulate that. Uh, Maria, hi Maria. Dr. Zahid, what will you advise for the reapplicant for SOP? <laughs> Great question. Um, ch change it up, change the story. Let them not read the same version as, as the previous year. Second very important thing to keep in mind is showing growth. Um, sometimes when you submit an SOP and you finish the capital application process and you have a couple of months before the interview invite comes through, you can actually send emails to your different admissions committees about what experiences we're accumulating. That shows growth and progress. Imagine if you can do that just between the time you submit the SOP and you get the interview. How much more can you substantiate between one year and the next year? So apart from changing the story, changing the narrative, make sure that you show growth. You show that you've done more after, the, after your rejection. You don't, you don't have to necessarily mention that I was rejected last cap cycle, but you should definitely show growth if people were to compare or remember who you are. I don't have research in my profile. Does that reduce my chances for DDS? Nope. Uh, I mean, okay, does that reduce my chances? Uh, mm, yeah, like I said, this, this isn't, uh, th it's not like a checklist which has each having a weighted score. It's not like research is 20%, personal SOP is 10% or something like that. At the end of the day, after reading your entire profile, if I feel confident that you'll succeed as a US dentist, I'm going to choose you into school. I'm going to call you for an interview invite. Research may be 
one influential aspect. If it's there, very very good. If it's not there, it's not detrimental as long as you can make up for it through other means. Think about differentiate research publications from research skills. Research skills is something that you would have already employed. For example, like when I I was in college, I did engineering. I used to write something called a record notebook. I used to, uh, uh, you know, take all my observations, write down my demonstration principles, and then eventually come with come up with my conclusions. Then I'll actually create a hypothesis. I'll do an experiment and record, tabulate what I get as results from the experiment. Those are research skills, right? Did I publish a paper with my record notebook? No. But did I learn what is required in research? Yes. And that's what I would talk about. So, think about. research skills and use that if you have research, research experience it's going to be a definite plus like actually having something that you published or you presented or you uh, even even with the publication there's a different hierarchy right there is like the ISBN full on you doing the research versus you just doing an article review there are different hierarchies so i think i think good good question though so i am an assistant 3 days a week so is it good to continue my work during my application cycle yes Yes, I mean I don't, I don't have to elaborate on that, Doctor Sneha, uh, Snehal, um, Hira. What do you think schools are tired tired of reading an SOP and really bothers them? What a question! Uh, schools are tired of reading why you came into the industry. Schools are tired of reading that you came to the US because you love the technology, and over here, schools are tired of reading that. Uh, you have experienced a lot of diversity because you're from india <laughs> schools are tired of reading that you came from the poorest family from the extremely remote rural place uh, in india and therefore you understand what financial constraints are and and i'm i'm not saying this yeah i am being a little like sarcastic about it and being hilarious but the fact is so if you look at the applicant pool at large at least the people who take coaching from like, my like us and our friends 80% are from southeast asia like 80% sometimes even more i have seen like interview interview panels filled with students from southeast asia within southeast asia a vast majority are from india and within india a vast majority are from north, the northwest primarily three states punjab gujarat and rajasthan how are you going to differentiate yourself from some other person from that particular from those places how, how, how do you like talk about a differentiation that the us admission committee will understand they are not evaluating you versus a candidate who grew up in rural kentucky they are evaluating with you with another candidate who is also from probably the same place as you are so they are they are tired of such such things and don't talk about those those experiences um yeah louise hello what do you mean by 5000 characters um so the limit on sop writing is 5200 characters for capid that's what i meant uh yeah here are definitely great question thank you what is the difference between volunteering and community service uh <laughs> very very good one one way to differentiate community service and volunteering is to go to is is this am i rendering services for, services for free or am i going to a place that is rendering free services that's the difference so community service can be something like you participating in a 5k marathon or you fundraising for a certain ngo or you taking part in a food bank you know soup kitchen kind of initiative volunteering can be you going and providing dental services in a community you going and uh, going to a dental practice or a, another like walmart and working for free right you can volunteer volunteer that and and rent the services you could volunteer at a conference to manage the front desk and give out pamphlets and id cards it, does the conference give anything for free to the community no they don't so you giving services for free is volunteering and the institution providing free services to the community that is community service that's the fundamental difference and it's really important you build experience on both places they'll teach you two different things um okay we have another person who wants to come on video pavitra okay now okay, pavitra declined okay <laughs> sumaya uh birds and spaces included yes yes you're right birds and spaces included oh thanks hera thanks for explaining 
what experiences can one get in USA on visitor's visa other than shadowing and volunteering? Um, you, you're not legally allowed to work anywhere. So that limits you from gathering a lot of experiences, but you can definitely shadow and volunteer. And when you think of shadowing and volunteering, don't restrict yourself to only thinking of um, third party institutions. You can also go to an academic medical center or a college and you can work with a professor on, on some short project. That's completely fine. Anything that does not give you a W2 or a 1099 that, that proves that you're getting a payment is something that you can definitely do. Um, exposure to US is different from experience to the US. So talk about exposure. If you have come to the US, you've, you've lived with your family in Texas and you've traveled to seven different states or like 17 different states, talk about that. That's exposure. That gives you exposure to diversity from different places, from different people, from different languages. Talk about that. If you have been to the border of Mexico, you've, you've had to learn Spanish to survive sometime. You've been in California. You've served at the, at a, at a institution that's very different from yours. Talk about that. Is it possible to maintain a common theme while portraying myself as a well-rounded dentist? If so, how can this be done? Uh, Addy, yes, theme can be common, but you can talk about all aspects. So let, let's say uh, the theme is mm, like there was an SOP which we wrote that the theme was question mark. How there are different experiences in life that ladder up and eventually become a question mark. Right? That's the theme. You can still talk about all the experiences within that. Um, I think this is a creative writing challenge. I don't have a straight answer to you, but this is probably something we can brainstorm offline. Some schools say that one LOR should be from a dental school dean. Do you know if there are chances they might not consider you because LOR was from the dean? Oh, I get what your question is. You're asking for the for the specific head of institution LOR, where yeah, you can replace that with the HOD, right? Um, this is a very, very um, say specific question and something that you can actually confirm with the school. But, but yes, I have, seen, I have seen applicants who have been unable to get uh, the LOR from their dean director or, or, or um, principal, whatever they like, like to call that role, and they have it to another person of authority from, from the same institution. Um, so just you need, to, you need to mail the school and get that, get that, this thing. The one school that probably replies pretty well is USC. Um, they reply to a lot of emails, so you can confirm with them before you go ahead with the process. Okay, you can register for dental conferences. Oh yeah, conferences, thanks for adding that. I forgot that to mention conferences. In fact, Noura herself attended close to 50 conferences. She also presented at uh, 20 conferences uh, in the East Coast. She went to New York, she went to Boston, she went to uh, DC, and she presented at conferences based on some initial research that she had published back in India. Um, so there was even a conference where Noura and I published, um, sorry, presented it together on how digital dentistry, uh, digital marketing can change dentistry in the US. So the, all of those are things that are, are open to you. Please do that because it, it does not get paid. Kathy, can you tell a little bit, more, little bit more about UCLA's SOP? Uh, does UCLA have its own SOP? I, I, I forget. Actually, please, please refresh my memory, Prateva. I don't know if it has its own SOP. Or are you talking about supplemental answers? I'm not sure. Um, Fauzia, is it mandatory to have LOR from US shadowing? LOR from US shadowing? Is it all right if I have three LORs from my dental school in India? Yes, it's all right if you have three LORs from dental school in India. But an LOR from a local? Um, is going to add more value and more credibility because it's surrogate marketing. They trust a local more than somebody who they've never seen and interfaced with. Should we mention rejection letters and admission as a reapplicant SOP? Any good question. Should you mention? No. Can you mention? Yes. Hira, what do you think is important to be added in a school specific SOP? <laughs> Great question. So let's say, let's say we're writing. Very, very good questions here. Um, let's say you're writing an SOP for CU. I would probably try to find out if any professor is researching in a, in a topic of interest that is related to me. I would also research a little bit about that location and the patient population that. So let's say in, in Colorado, there are people who 
have access to uh, Na Native American communities. And there's also a Native American um, cent center of excellence in Colorado. That is a critical aspect, right? How they serve that population too. You can write about those, those things. Uh, Colorado has a big passion for art and that's why they have a lot of art installations. Um, there's something called the Balls of Iron within Colorado University. So you can talk about those aspects. You can talk about specific, um, specific dental labs. They have a digital dentistry lab in Colorado University. You can talk about that. You can speak about any alumni who have been from your institution who have gone to Colorado in the past. You can, you can address that. Uh, so basically, you're, you're getting hyper-focused on things that that school can relate with, either their own center of excellence or their credentials or their alumni or their students or their faculty uh, and their research and, and bring that within your SOP. That will make a huge difference. Sai Kal Kalyani, uh, is it good to take an LOR from the doctor that I did observership and one from the dental assistant and one from my undergrad? I've never heard of someone who's taken an LOR from a dental assistant. Um, and I think there's a requirement to have two LORs, the first two LORs from your institution, one from a dean and one from a faculty. I would recommend taking five LORs in total, in which two are from your school and three are from, a, from the US, if, if you can, uh, or from somebody you've worked under, maybe a, an Indi like an Indian dentist if you're from India, a second one from a US dentist, and a third one from a, from a different place. But have at least five LORs so that you can mix and match depending on the schools preferences. There are certain schools that, that accommodate additional LORs in your application if you can mail them after you finish capping. So having five LORs is a very good strategy. What is the procedure for uploading LOR and capping? <laughs> oh my god, I'm not going to answer this here. We'll probably put a video about this. It's, pre it's pretty straightforward. Um, but, but good question, Fauzia. Not making fun of who, uh, your question. Disha, can I include non-health professional water experiences? Yes. Yes. Like I said, to become a good healthcare professional, you cannot, it, it's not, I mean, you don't build those skills only within a hospital or a dental practice. You can build those skills anywhere, right? Uh, community service, empathy, and so on. Is it okay if I'm, a, okay, a lot of questions. I'm going to close the uh, live for now. I think it's been, a little over an hour, an hour and a half almost. Thank you so much for the 60 people who joined this live and um, who've been a big part of this session. It was an absolute pleasure meeting you virtually and answering your questions uh, and teaching you a little bit about how we craft SOPs here and hopefully making magic in your SOPs. Please um, ping us with additional questions. I know a lot of questions have been unanswered on this live, so DM us so that we can get back to you soon. And uh, always encourage Gap and Simplified. We've been getting your endorsements, your endowments through payments and distributing that to the dental community over the last three years. We want to continue to do that. Till date, Noura and I have not taken a single penny from Gap and Simplified for our own personal interests. And that's the way we want this to be. We want this to be built by dental applicant international community for inter the international community. Um, so if you believe in our cause, support our cause and help spread the word. Thank you so much.